Games are too expensive to make, and as a result, we need microtransactions, gambling loot boxes, Doritos codes, season passes, KFC achievements, and so much more. But what if I told you that you've been had? Let's chat about it in the comments below, but first, my opinion, I'm Tarmac, and this is Feature Creep. When you bring certain arguments to the table against microtransactions, blind box crates, and other post-purchase items, it's extremely common to be hit with the answer that games are too expensive to make, and as a result, these things have to happen. It's commonly followed up with the argument that price hasn't kept up with inflation. One thing to note, however, is that neither of these arguments are directly in favor of microtransactions. Rather, they're just necessary because the industry is unsustainable otherwise, which is a pretty strong claim to make. The concept of games are too expensive to make is not new, and it has some very odd etymology. It actually is quite difficult to find game developers or publishers making this claim. Rather, it tends to come from places like The Economist, Gama Sutra, Reddit. It's as though it's an almost entirely community and media-driven explanation, with folks doing what they can to post analysis of the situation, or letting their fandom bleed through and repeating things they heard one time as though it was gospel to defend their favorite company. It's the ultimate justification. Microtransactions are necessary because games are too expensive to make. The issue at play is that without the actual financial data from game publishers on the costs of development, marketing, overhead, and of course proper sales figures, it's difficult to know whether a particular game was too expensive or not from a cost standpoint and whether it resulted in a profit or loss. We get snippets which give some clues, but really only on the biggest blockbusters that are successful enough for companies to boast about. GTA V is a great example here, with its 265 million combined development and marketing cost, but even then, we'll only hear that it sold 80 million plus units as of May this year, rather than an actual dollar figure taking into account games bought at less than full price. I wanted to figure out for myself what is actually going on here, because there's definitely been a marked shift in the direction post-launch monetization is going, and what I found is actually quite interesting. Something happened in 2010 which turned the industry around and changed its focus. This is a graph that I put together of a few of the big publishers. What it represents is the cost of goods sold over the years, shown in millions of dollars. For those not aware, cost of goods sold is an accounting phrase that refers to the direct cost of producing a thing which will return some future value by being sold. Things like the boxes games go in, cost of shipping those boxes to stores, revenue splits paid to Valve every time a game is sold on Steam, etc. Very little if any development costs are included here as they normally fall under research and development on financial documents because it's really hard to attribute these costs directly to a production line. I adjusted all of these numbers for inflation so that we can say with some degree of certainty that the data is consistent across that whole time period to 2017 value. I also really wanted to adjust them for inflation because that's a common argument trundled up on game forums that games haven't adjusted for inflation, therefore they should be more expensive. Price is absolutely an influencing factor, but by no means a decisive one. If the price and number of games you sell remain the same, but costs go down faster than inflation goes up, you have a net profit situation and don't also need to raise the price for inflation as well. Economics 101 When you look at the cost of goods sold over a 7 year period of time, you can see that the amount of money spent each year making the products that they sell us is decreasing. By a lot. Now this doesn't mean that games individually are getting cheaper to make, not by a long shot, because this is the physical production, not development. What it does mean is that something happened in and around 2010 that caused all three of these publishers to go in the same direction. That something is digital distribution. They're spending far less on the actual production of the physical products that they sell us and by significant amounts. The 30% Valve takes is definitely less than the cost of putting a box on a Walmart shelf especially when you consider that some of these publishers don't pay that base 30% cost that an indie developer would. This is point number one in my contention of the idea that games are too expensive to make. The production costs have fallen in the last seven years by quite a bit, an average of about 35%, with the notable exception of what Activision did last year, which was the King acquisition. Incidentally, all of Activision's numbers jumped with that acquisition. When making the claim that games are getting too expensive to make and thus we need microtransactions, 
to see a 35% average decline in the amount publishers are spending on the cost of goods sold kind of hurts the claim a wee bit, especially since the cost of goods sold is an enormous part of the overall budget. The next piece that interested me a great deal, and I have a couple of graphs for this one as well, is that for the most part, the cost of research and development has remained relatively stagnant over the past seven years. Again, this is adjusted for inflation as well. We do see the king spike for Activision in 2016, and Electronic Arts is even trending downwards on what it spends on development every year. Marketing is actually a similar story, with relatively stagnant progression, except that the King acquisition really shows itself off here, an indication that King's marketing budget was enormous. By now, those in the audience who are interested in or interact with the exciting world of corporate finance on a day-to-day -day basis may have noticed that I'm just going down the balance sheet. This is all public information, and those of you in the know will be wanting to point out, Tarmac, you can't compare all of these things like this. There are too many unknowns. And you'd be right. I'm not doing a direct comparison, especially because Activision has a December fiscal year end while the other two end in March. Rather, what I'm doing is looking for trends. What we've seen so far is that year over year, on average, cost of production is going down. And despite any small increases on occasion in development and marketing, that reduced cost of production is going down at a much faster rate. Well, if you were going to claim that games are too expensive to make, Seeing some of these costs dropping faster than corresponding development costs should be rising is a little bit odd. What's also really interesting to look at, though, when seeing all of this is the net revenue of these big publishers. Much like the previous, we have some overall growth, with the expected king spike for Activision, but relatively stagnant otherwise. So costs of production are going down significantly, marketing and development have mild growth, and revenue is pretty similar as well. So, how is all of that possible if this is the trend for the number of games each of these publishers is producing every year? This graph shows the number of multi-platform games by year by publisher, excluding mobile. It's rather dramatic. I won't claim that each year has exactly the same tier of games, as that's certainly not true. But what is clear is that the big publishers in the game industry have made a choice to focus on a smaller number of titles. So if development cost has remained static with fewer games, then certainly more money is being spent on the development of each game. The same is true with marketing. And with fewer games from an aggregated perspective, each publisher will have fewer overall sales simply by virtue of releasing fewer titles and lower cost of goods sold for the same reason. And here are some examples. In 2010, Rockstar North released Red Dead Redemption, LA Noir in 2011, Max Payne 3 in 2012, and Grand Theft Auto 5 in 2013. GTA Online was so popular that all yearly releases ceased for them. A studio went from releasing a game per year to what's looking like a five-year gap until RDR 2. It was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that a studio could subside on the ongoing revenue of microtransactions, and it's worth keeping in mind that GTA 5 was in development for years, back to that mysterious 2010 time when all of this began to shift. Another example is taking a close look at Blizzard. All development has obviously ceased on Diablo 3 because there's no way to monetize it. No matter who has a great idea over there, the profit numbers on anything for Diablo will pale in comparison to the rest of the Blizzard catalog. It's hard to ask for funding for a project when the company could put the same amount of money into the next three or four Hearthstone expansions. In the world of business, and more specifically the world of the stock market, consistency is key. Shareholders get really antsy with a boom and bust cycle, which is why the movie industry has so many outlets for revenue outside of just tickets at the theater. The game industry had this same problem, especially at the upper end. If you look at past years of finance, you'll often see that boom and bust. A massive title one year, propping up the entire rest of the year performing poorly. For an industry that doesn't like to take chances, gaming sure did take a few. The shift we're seeing here is how effective microtransactions are at evening out the boom and bust cycle of game development. Instead of wildly fluctuating profit and loss numbers, now in the last few years we have relative consistency. And that consistency and growth, even if it's slower, is better to shareholders because as much as the stock market is a risky place to be, shareholders don't really like risk all that much in the general sense. But here's the kicker. 
By the time these three publishers made the jump to microtransactions in their multiplayer games, and now single-player games apparently, excluding a particularly bad year for Ubisoft in 2013, they were all well into significantly profitable territory. Keep in mind that microtransactions in big games were pioneered by Valve in a lot of ways, with the marketplace and hats, and came into AAA games around the time of Mass Effect 3 in 2012. That's when blind pack microtransactions started in earnest, even then through to Battlefield and so on. There's a big difference between being forced to include microtransactions to make ends meet, and including them because they make a ton of extra money. Video games were never too expensive to make. We've seen this proven by titles like Hellblade, where a studio was perfectly capable of putting together a visually stunning title and do well without the enormous budget to go along with it. Microtransactions were not needed to solve the non-existent problem of games development costs ballooning out of the publisher's control. It's quite the opposite. Combined with the cost of production dropping in a huge way, the publishers lowered the variety and quantity of the products just to keep the guaranteed success franchises spend far more on marketing each game, and of course, keep the risk reducing microtransactions for the ongoing income. Where's the need here, when all of these companies were well profitable consistently every year by the time Mass Effect 3 and subsequently GTA 5 paved the way? The industry could have gone the other way to mitigate risk by making larger numbers of smaller projects. Instead, they came to realize from watching the mobile market that gamers will buy just about anything, unfortunately. If you combine the big ticket development, marketing, and cost of goods sold, you'll find that each of the three big publishers is spending less on making games now, overall, than they were seven years ago. Using development, marketing, and cost of goods sold as the primary contributors to getting a game out to consumers, Ubisoft spent 5% less in 2016 than 2010, Activision spent 28% less, and Electronic Arts spent 35% less. And yet, each is earning record profits despite those cost reductions. But, but microtransactions were supposed to be necessary because games were too expensive to make. The businesses saw the opportunity to lower costs by moving to digital distribution, produce fewer, more expensive games with microtransactions, and hit the moon with their profits. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't need to do it. They were all doing well by the time these loot boxes and other silliness became totally commonplace. Microtransactions aren't saving the game industry from out-of-control development costs. They're just roads to wider margins. The publishers all and at the same time started adding microtransactions while spending less overall on making games every year. Remember, it's a rare thing for someone to actually present an argument in favor of microtransactions. At best, people will claim that they are neutral and don't affect anything, but rarely if ever will someone want more microtransactions when asked outright. An argument for neutrality is not an argument in favor of a thing. This is often when the point about games being too expensive will come out because the person still wants to defend their favorite game company that's just being greedy. But as you can see from the data, the choice to move in the direction of an even smaller number of more expensive games every year while spending less overall and taking in record profits puts that conclusion on very nebulous turf. Even Xbox boss Shannon Loftus, when asked pointed questions about single-player non-microtransactional games dying out, wouldn't say anything about them not being profitable. Just that the economics are more complicated. She believes these single-player only games will always be there. It has nothing to do with the games not being profitable. They're just not as profitable as the ones that perpetually hold open your wallet. So maybe, just maybe, it's time that we stopped accepting games are too expensive to make as an argument in favor of what I would say are less than ethical business decisions, because it's simply not true. This video is the culmination of me spending two weeks buried in Excel and financial documents, so I really hope that it was helpful to you. My channel's always been one of slow growth, presumably because YouTube hates me, so if you enjoyed this video or just found it useful, I would really appreciate it if you shared it around on places like Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, NeoGAF, because it helps me out immensely. Feature Creep is a regular show on my channel and it's brought to all of you lovely folk ad-free because of a group of very generous people who back me on Patreon. Thank you all. My name's Tarmac. That's all I have to say.